Kia ora tato. Uh, welcome to this discussion in which we aim to understand or increase our understanding of the challenges and opportunities facing those living with a disability. Colinda Clark Aho, I am uh, the co leader of Denton's Kensington Swans public law team based in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, and today's discussion was prompted by the work of our own ABLE social impact group. This group is working hard within our firm to educate all of us about disability, uh, but also to improve the opportunities and experiences for our clients um, and our staff with disability. Joining me today is New Zealand's Disability Rights Commissioner, Paula Tesoriero. She is someone who is supremely qualified to talk about redefining what we think about disability and what is possible for people living with disabilities. In her role as the Disability Rights Commissioner, Paula has a broad mandate under the Human Rights Act 1993 to protect and promote the rights of disabled New Zealanders. <clears throat> Paula brings real life experience to this role. She is a former lawyer and was a senior public servant for a number of years. Paula is also a Paralympian, cycling gold medalist, and she holds several sports related and governance roles, including being a life trustee of the Helberg Foundation and a member of the New Zealand Sports Tribunal. She was also the chef de mission for the New Zealand Paralympic team for Tokyo 2020. She spends her days advocating for those with all kinds of disability. Now the conversation we're about to have should take about an hour. Uh, we're happy for uh, those of you participating to send us questions anytime, just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll just remind you that this conversation is being recorded. Paula, kia ora and welcome. Kia ora Linda, thank you so much for having me and kia ora tato to everyone listening. Great to have you. Let's start with, um, you know, a little bit of bio, a little bit of life story really. Tell us about your life experience that led to you becoming the Disability Rights Commissioner at the Human Rights Commission. So I grew up on the Kapiti Coast, which for anyone listening from outside of New Zealand, it's a, a town which is about an hour north of Wellington, our capital. And I grew up out there as a young disabled person. Uh, I'm an amputee, and so that's the impairment that I live with. And growing up, there were a couple of things that always really stood out to me. One was I loved riding a bike. So you could find me as a kid racing around the streets of Kapiti on my bike. And secondly, the other thing that really struck me is I didn't see other disabled people riding their bikes around or at school or anywhere really or on TV. I just never really saw other disabled people. And that impacted the way I thought about disability growing up and the way that I thought about myself growing up. And inevitably, what it led to really was steering clear of anything disability related. And so I quite intentionally, purposefully did that. I told very few people about my impairment. Uh, I hid it the best that I could, which wasn't always that easy since it's reasonably obvious. And I went off to law school uh, in Wellington and studied law and politics and went and practiced law, uh, public law as well, uh, for one of the big firms in Wellington. And that was my career trajectory. I was off and I was fiercely protective of my identity. And then a couple of years into working, some friends and I started doing duathlons and triathlons for fun. And I was doing the cycling leg and they were doing the others. And we found out we were not too bad. Like actually we were, we were doing okay. And so people were saying to me, if you're doing okay against people motoring along with two legs and, and you know, hardcore trainers, have you thought about giving Paralympic sport a go? And I honestly hadn't. And then there was something that just switched on inside me that I couldn't let go of. And it was this real desire to see if I could, could give this a crack. And so 
I approached Paralympics New Zealand and the journey of Paralympic sport sort of um, then started. But what that journey gave me more than anything, more than anything else, I mean, the medals and the accolades and, and things are, are wonderful and I, I treasure them. But actually what I treasure more is the fact that that journey gave me an understanding of an ultimate acceptance of being a disabled person because when you start winning races and people are writing about you and things you're you're out in the public domain and you're out there as a disabled person and that was a little bit confronting at first but actually it really led to quite a bit of soul searching and emerging as a very proud disabled person and then that took me on a on a journey quite different than I had imagined. So having worked in public law and private practice, I then went into the public service for a period of time while I was also racing. And as I came to the end of my time cycling, I really wanted to give back to the community. And so I started serving on different boards. So boards like Paralympics New Zealand, the Halberg Board, um, the New Zealand Artificial Limb Service, Sport Wellington, and realised I, I really had this love and need to continue to serve the disability community. So when the role of Disability Rights Commissioner came up, it was a wonderful mix of law and policy and disability, and it was just a role that I... Um, felt really, really spoke to my values and the things that I'm good at. And I've had a, a blast for the last five years. It's incredibly challenging work. You know, disability is hard in the sense that our community are facing so many challenges, um, but it's a role that I have, I have really, really enjoyed. We'll come to those challenges in a moment, but I just want to reflect on your childhood from, for, again for a second, because it's such an interesting story in that I imagine, you know, it, for, for many um, New Zealand, for, for many people that, that are amputees, for example, their road to um, sort of you know, becoming the, 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 the sort of adult that they finally are um, is probably the reverse, right? Because a, a child with a, with an, a child amputee is, is, it seems to me, more likely to be defined by their disability at the beginning, if not by them, but by their family. So your family clearly had, um, you know, a real can-do attitude right from the get-go. Absolutely. I, I had an older brother um, who pushed me along the way, and, uh, and then, then we got a, a younger sister, and my family really embracing of disability you know um, they they understood that it, it would be part of all of our lives and they've continued to um, push in a in a nurturing and supportive way and support all their all my endeavors along the way but you know that it is a really really important point Linda because you know there are many people in the lives of young disabled people who can at times set lower expectations uh, or be nervous about their loved one participating in different things for, for a range of really legitimate reasons. Uh, we know that often, um, you know, young disabled people talk to me about sort of growing up in an environment where teachers and family members had lower expectations um, in order to, I guess, cushion the blow sometimes as young people grow up. Uh, and, and that, you know, that, that can be, um, that can really affect the way you perceive disability. So I was, I was fortunate to have a really, yeah, a, a family that was very supportive. The perception of disability is something I want to talk about because I think that's so defining. Um, in some ways, and Paralympics is a good way into that conversation. So, in, in particular, I mean, certainly in New Zealand, we've seen over a period of time, certainly in my lifetime, <clears throat> that 
the Paralympics have become something that the whole of New Zealand can get behind, get really excited about. We have these heroes, these wonderful, you know, the Sophie Pascoes and these just these wonderful athletes um, that the whole country um, champions and, and is excited to see them performing on the world stage. But, but it also, there's a kind of um, mixed blessing with that, it seems to me, because it's one of those moments where um, it's a sort of blip on the timeline for a blip in time. Disabled New Zealanders are champions and we celebrate their strength and determination. Um, and then the Paralympics end. And once again, disability is invisible. Do you know what I mean by that? Absolutely. And I th look, I think it's invisible for a couple of reasons. One, many impairments are literally invisible. Mm. So, you know, you'll be undertaking your work, going about your ordinary life. And given that 24% of New Zealand's population is disabled, you will be seeing, encountering and dealing with disabled people every day, but you actually might not know it. And so because of that, there's a natural, um, I think, just a you, people don't think about disability. I think the other reason, and it touches on the point you just made, um, Linda, that there will be pockets of promotion around disability and it might and the Paralympics is a really good example where it's very big it's very visible um, and you know broadcasting of the Paralympics is really growing and so you see those moments but what we don't see enough of in New Zealand are disabled leaders who are really um, comfortable talking about disability and identifying as a disabled leader um, and, and people just sort of doing different roles where disability is a bit more visible. And so I think that's the other reason why it can seem invisible. And that of course has really, really negative impacts in terms of people just not thinking about the needs and aspirations of disabled people. Mm. You mentioned um, earlier the challenges that the, that people with disability face in our society, and I and and I want to tease out some of those um, because, um, as you say, twenty four percent, so one in four New Zealanders currently identify as having a disability. Um, would you say they face systemic discrimination? Without a doubt. Uh, there is no question in my mind, uh, no doubt in my mind about that. Disabled people face systemic discrimination uh, on, an, on a number of areas. Um, firstly, exclusion from the education system. You know, we like to think that we do include all disabled children, uh, as is their legal right, in um, in school, but actually there's so much about the settings that can create real challenges for disabled people. Um, we know that uh, people report low uh, levels of reasonable accommodation by employers. So disabled people wanting to work, but employers not being able to make those reasonable accommodations. Um, there are significantly lower rates of employment. So disabled people have twice the rate of unemployment as non-disabled people uh, and lower rates of pay for the employment that disabled people are in. Uh, disabled people are, experience higher rates of poverty and in particular disabled children experience high levels of material hardship. We also know that disabled people experience worse health outcomes than non-disabled people, particularly those with learning um, learning impairments. We know that there's a lack of access to different types of communication. So, you know, um, Braille and easy read for people with learning disabilities, um, New Zealand Sign Language. Um, so, you know, people being able to even just access information that everyone else can access. So there's a range of, you know, range of areas where at that very tough systemic level, disabled people face enormous discrimination. 
And when you list that, I mean, it's a, it's a substantial list and it covers every part of a person's possible living experience. Why do you think that as a form of discrimination, it's taken longer for us to um, even identify that this exists? You know, if you compare this with the other isms, mm. um, disability is really the last cab off the, or a later cab off the rank, isn't it? It is. And I think, you know, one, one of the isms that we don't talk about, and in fact, few people can name is ableism. Uh, and, and it's rife in terms of conscious and unconscious ableism, where people assume that if you don't have particular characteristics, that you're not able to do things. And so a whole lot of judgment is made about that. One of the things we subscribe to uh, in the disability community is the social model of disability, which says the person is not disabled by their individual impairment, but actually what disables people is everything around us, attitudes, infrastructure, um, communication, um, you know, buildings, places and spaces. And those are those are the things that disable us. So when people think about disability, they're often basing it on an erroneous sort of fundamental belief that disabled people cannot do something rather than disabled people are prevented from doing something. So when you think about discrimination, you tend to think about someone or an organization has prevented someone from participating. And so you, you naturally go to that sort of discrimination point. But if your starting point is that person, that disabled person can't do something, you're not thinking about it through a discrimination lens. And so I think that's why often people don't look at their own behaviors or the way they design their own services and policies and build their own buildings and infrastructure. They're not thinking about it from the starting point of what can I do? What can my organization do to ensure that disabled people can participate in the world that I'm creating? And if we thought more in that way, people would realize they were discriminating perhaps more than they would really want to because inherently most people are good people <laughs> it is sort of so tied up with that question of um expectation that you raised earlier isn't it i mean there's sort of a um it, it, it's a kind of unconscious bias but i think it's a deeply um rooted lower set of expectations for people with disability there's just a society as a whole has lower expectations of where, where someone with disability will want to go, what they would want to do, what they want to participate in. And, and it kind of unconsciously drives all of that in some way. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, in my view, we, we, we need to start having that national conversation about ableism. You know, we've had some really good conversations about racism over the years. We've had good conversations. Um, uh, you know, about other um, communities. We've had really good conversations about um, mental health and, and, you know, really trying to sort of reduce the, the stigma of, of mental health. We've had those national campaigns and, you know, we've, we've sort of had the, the pride movement um, really garner that sort of national support and focus and in the disability community we haven't really done that yet and I think the more that we can do that the more we can pull something off that enables that national conversation then I think we will start to get to a, a, a better place. We're having this conversation on an interesting week because of course at the beginning of this week the Royal Commission into abuse and state care began hearing the evidence from the disabled community and some of that evidence I mean that's still ongoing so as we I mean the Royal Commission's sitting again today and I think into next week but um, I mean some of that evidence 
that's been heard so far is amongst the most bleak evidence that the Royal Commission has heard. And it's heard some pretty awful evidence in the, in the, in the last year. But really, evidence of um, people with disabilities being dehumanised and um, forgotten in, in homes like Kimberley and, and so forth. What are you, I'm going to guess you weren't surprised because because of your, um, you know, the experience in the community that you're working with. But I mean, what do you make of, of that evidence? Uh, look, I think it, I think it's, uh, it's a stain on our history that is really important to be told and listened to. The stories that I've listened to, are they're very painful for our community. And you know, I put a message out on social media yesterday just to you know, really keep encouraging the community to be gentle and look after each other and to understand that that is a, a very shocking but very real part of our history. But, but make no mistake, <laughs> violence and abuse mm. towards disabled people is a very real here and now matter. We know that disabled people experience violence and abuse today in significantly disproportionately higher rates than non-disabled people. You only need to look at the recent crime and victim survey that came out that put disabled people as likely to experience um, uh, crime across every, every type of crime than non-disabled people. Uh, in December last year, I uh, commissioned and released two reports which brought together the evidence that we have in New Zealand. Um, around violence and abuse towards disabled people. And, you know, we expect to learn a lot coming out of the Royal Commission. And it's really important that those historical wrongs are, you know, put right. But it's critically important that we actually do everything we can to stop the violence and abuse that is happening now and you know everyone's got a responsibility in that uh, one of the things that was very evident from the crime and victim survey was that family members are one of the groups um, more so than others who um, you know commit crimes against disabled people and you know we know that that, that beyond that um, that women and girls are at the conservative end four times more likely to experience sexual harm, um, disabled women and girls than non-disabled women and girls. So the stories in the Royal Commission are harrowing and important that we understand and it's equally important that we don't somehow have some mythical idea abuse is in the past, it very much happens now. I think one of the things that we're better at doing now is having better monitoring and, and auditing of settings which can give rise to abuse of disabled people. But even so, you know, we need to make sure that that continues too, that there are, in, you know, independent people who, who keep a check on, on things. Um, in those settings. And one of the um, research outcomes that we know from, from worldwide research is that those residential settings where disabled people live their lives um, are settings which can, you know, can give rise to increased um, levels of abuse. It doesn't mean it's happening, if, you know, doesn't mean it's happening in those residential settings now, but the settings themselves give rise to that. But we certainly know, um, you know, New Zealand has has a problem with family violence, sexual violence. We we know this. We know we have a whole joint venture in government 
who have the job of, of eliminating that. And one of the things that we've been closely involved in around our advocacy is making sure that disabled people are very much on that train um, so that issues can be addressed. I get a bit excited. I get I get very um, into this topic, Linda, because it 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 maddens and saddens me <laughs> that violence and abuse continues at such disproportionate levels against. Well, it's people. about power and vulnerability, isn't it? As Absolutely. Always. I mean, sexual violence is always about power and vulnerability. But if you have a if you have one part of the community that you know has particular vulnerability, then kind of having visibility about that absolutely um, is one way to, to start that that process so so also this week and this is a more positive thing but it it um and and maybe it will begin to address some of the things we've just been talking about but this week we were well, last week we saw the creation of the new ministry for disabled people so how significant is that i think the new ministry is really significant it's you know, it's it's part of that visibility issue that we talked about at the start, where there have been disabled people for many decades now who have advocated for an entity like the new ministry to create a sense of visibility across government. And it doesn't remove the need for government agencies, uh, you know, education and health and transport, and every other you know, government agency that exists, it doesn't remove their need to do better by disabled people. One of the, the I think, you know, really crucial roles of the new ministry will be to act as that stewardship of disability issues across government. Now, that's not easy and it takes time to, to, to you know, have a, a, a systemic effect like that. But it will be important that the organisation can do that, you know, can really help other government agencies do better for disabled people. The other critical role the entity has is it actually has a, a reasonably large service delivery function mm -hmm. to provide disability support services to the approximate 45,000 disabled people who receive um, things like in-home care, respite care, supported living, um, and there is a program of work um, that the government announced as part of its budget announcements to really try and transform the way those services are delivered. And as part of the health reforms, the reason that those disability support services were taken out of the Ministry of Health was to make supporting disabled people less of a health issue that's sort of back to that social model thing um, where the opposite to a social model is a medical model where you say you need to fix that person mm -hmm. and when you continue to have things in a health setting you sort of it kind of perpetuates that message so the government moved you know with strong advocacy from the community um, and the government support moved those services into the new ministry with the intention that those services become less about health and more about actually how do we support disabled people so this is the whole of, whole of life whole of life stuff that yeah. would right okay and so how different will that actually look do you think so the intent is and this has been trialed in, in a few places but the intention is that rather than, you know, and I'm, I'm generalizing here a little bit, but rather than um, a disabled person receiving money in a very prescriptive way, you know, you can have this and you can do these five things with it and you can go to these six places to get that and you must use it for this, this and this. Bearing in mind that people who receive disability support services are likely to receive them across their life. It's not a, it's not a temporary thing, right? So you want people to live good, long lives, with a good sense of well-being. So what the transformation is about is actually allowing disabled people to have much more um, control over what would be a personalized budget. So here's your 
envelope of money and of course you have to use it for you know respite care is probably a good example Mm. but how you choose to do that respite is up to you and you don't need the government to tell you that this is the only kind of respite care you can have actually if you want to buy a trampoline for your child because that gives you two hours of respite in a day go for it Mm. so it's really just about creating a bit more flexibility choice and control and we we know from the pilots that have occurred that that has led to better outcomes for people. That question of control has been hard fought, hasn't it? Um, Absolutely. From the community. So there is a sort of, um, the, 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 the default setting is that government, whatever government agency it is, holds the money, you know, tighter and knows better as to, yep. you know, how that money should be spent. So over the last five years, maybe we've seen, or, or since um, the previous government, actually, there's been a real tussle mm. over the policy settings for that. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So so um, the genesis of what's called Enabling Good Lives started sort of almost 10 years ago. And what's been great is that, you know, successive governments have, have um, continued to support that approach. Um, which I th- is, is really positive and that this doesn't seem to be a party political, you know, um, thing. And that gives me real confidence that this approach will be enduring. And over those 10 years, you know, it, it, it really started from a, a group of disabled people who, who did want to wrestle a bit of choice and control um, and, you know, wanted things out of that health setting and so there's been lots of negotiation with ministers of the day over those years and the way in which things were tested and trialed was sort of through four sort of pilots around the country and they all all have a unique difference in the way that they've been run. Um, There's also been other you know important changes where family members can now be paid uh, to care for their disabled um, family member if they if they meet the criteria um, and so that has you know also um, helped families you know I think there are some big challenges that inevitably um, you know the, the community continue to push for and and those are things like you know there are more than 45,000 New Zealanders who need disability support services and um, you know it it is going to take a change of policy settings and quite an increase in funding uh, over time to be able to address that wider unmet need. Yeah because how I mean what are the consequences of that unmet need? I mean at the moment what are the real life consequences? One of the things I've uh, advocated you know very strongly on has been um, people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder not having access to those disability support services. So, you know, um, of, of course, there are people with FASD who um, do not go down a criminal trajectory, but sadly, we know that that many do. And that, uh, you know, actually our youth justice system and our adult prison population again have disproportionate numbers of disabled people in them and you know that is ambulance at the at the bottom of the cliff stuff and you know I think I think um, really investing in that early intervention and giving people money to to live a good life from the start that whole of life approach um, surely will lead to better outcomes than you know spending that money uh, at the wrong end of the system but it always seems hard for governments around the world really to to really do that early intervention and and spend up front um, to get the right outcomes long term but it it, well and that's got to be one of the challenges for the new ministry isn't it because it's going to be a small ministry as they as as um and it's it is going to be competing for funds and for for um, 
voice, if you like, um, with all these very well-established, entrenched mega ministries that we invariably have like every other country. Um, that That's going to be tough for them. So I'm imagining, I mean, you, you obviously spend your life um, with a lot of people from the disability community. I mean, what are their expectations about how much the ministry can deliver and what a difference it can make? I think there are really big expectations uh, and that's right. There should be big expectations because, you know, we're trying to shift the dial like this for disabled people. It's not a little nudge. Uh, I think that people are beginning to understand that, you know, the, the mere presence of a ministry does not resolve those issues overnight and that it is going to take time to build the organisation. It will take time to um, embed relationships across government to figure out the operating model of how the new ministry will work, how it will influence change. Um, and, and that's, you know, that that's to be expected. I think it's going to be an, an interesting balancing act between, you know, building the organisation sensibly and, and, you know, making sure that it, it um, has what it needs um, and takes the time that it needs to be built properly. But at the same time, disabled people can't wait forever for change. So I would hope that the new ministry can start to deliver some change, um, you know, along the way while it is building itself to be an organisation that's really robust and can be on a, a much more equal footing, if you like, with those well entrenched agencies so that when you're around the table, you know, you're not you're not the little agency, but actually you're, you know, you've 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 done the hard work to be able to have those robust conversations. At the moment it's really still in the very early setup phases mm -hmm. and it's got a kind of acting CEO. It's important, isn't it, that whoever gets the role of CEO of that ministry actually is a member of the mm -hmm community of people who have disabilities don't you think oh absolutely I mean my my hope is that the new ministry is an organization that is an exemplar of how you employ disabled people so I would expect that um, you know reasonable accommodation um, you know reasonable accommodations you know, are, are made I would anticipate that disabled people uh, will you know will be a very strong part of that organization uh, that the leadership team uh, will have disabled people around the table um, and that it will really become an exemplar of of a, a great disability organization and and be able to share the lessons learned with other government agencies and and not just government but but other organizations too um, and be able to really demonstrate what um, you know employing disabled people looks like um, the visibility of disabled people um, across government so I think you know there's there are really exciting things um, to look forward to with the new ministry but you're right it it is going to take some time to get some of the basics right because you inevitably don't want to be in that situation where you're trying to build this thing as it's flying really fast and, and you don't get some of those basics right. Um, it's quite interesting, that question. I mean, it, 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 looking at the um, ministry as a potential exemplar of how workplaces might be, I mean, that's certainly something that we've been thinking about here, and it's one of the prompts for this conversation, yeah. really. I mean, what does a, a workplace that, if you like, to go back to your earlier point, um, you know, confronts its own ableism. But what does that workplace look like? Well, it, it certainly sounds like you're you're on that journey um, well and truly. I think a, a, an organisation that's modelling disability is one where um, there are disabled people um, clearly already in the organisation. Um, so if you're looking to join an organisation and you know there are disabled people working there, that, that's a, an instant sort of um, feeling of comfort, I think, for people. Um, 
one of the other you know, really important aspects for organizations to get right is the recruitment process itself. So, you know, are your recruitment processes such that even the basic information is in a range of accessible formats? Um, do you, you know, follow the same traditional recruitment process as most people, which is, you know, asking for a CV and a cover letter and uh, getting a person in for an interview and all of that? Or do you open yourselves to doing things differently? Actually, an interview for a lot of people, lots of people actually, <laughs> non-disabled people too, but, you know, um, for many disabled people, an interview is not going to be the way to um, really know the strengths of that person. So how flexible can organizations be in looking at different ways? Um, you know, I remember um, it was an executive from Microsoft who came out a few years ago and I met with her and she was telling me that um, they specifically uh, have a, a part of their recruitment process where they really want neurodiverse people because um, they can be great at, you know, cracking codes and, and creating products for people. And so rather than doing interviews and things, what she said, you know, wasn't going to work, that actually they just had a day where people came in and showed what they could do and asked what type of reasonable accommodation they would need. And often it was just, actually, I want to be in a corner by myself and I want, you know, I want this and, and um, I want to be able to work from home, you know, a couple of days a week. And so that's what they did. And they, you know, <laughs> they're a leading edge uh, mm. global organization. And so it's really about, you know, and it's really about talking to people, um, you know, either potential employees or, or disabled employees about, you know, what, what do you need to thrive in this workplace? And there's, you know, often these myths that circle around that, you know, it's going to cost more to have a disabled person. Well, those myths have been busted well and truly now. And, you know, every organization has to um, deal with all sorts of reasonable requests from employees. You know, I, I need, I have a sick relative to care for. I've got childcare responsibilities. I've got health problems, um, you know, and, and really disability is no different. It's just one of those features of the human condition that employers need to, be able to uh, accommodate and in a funny sort of way one of the pluses of COVID God there's not there hasn't really been very many but one of them has been that it has actually shaken up workplace culture a lot hasn't it I mean we're all here we are we wouldn't have had this conversation in this way two years ago so it, some of that has is is presents opportunity right for the absolutely community I mean one of the ironies is you know for years disabled people have wanted much more flexibility to work from home, work in, in a way like this. And, you know, it, it's always been too hard. Suddenly COVID comes along and, well, we just make it work for the entire country. And, you know, that that point did not escape our community that, well, what, what is it about the way we think that says, <laughs> excuse me, that says, if we have to do it for the whole country, we'll just find a way to do it. But if actually a portion of the community want to work this way, no, it's too hard. And so we kind of have to get a bit better, I think, at, at listening to people um, and, and listening to, to, you know, what will make people thrive. I think the other interesting thing is, you know, we've, we've got these um, short, work shortages across so many sectors at the moment. And yet we continue to have these really disproportionately high unemployment rates for disabled people. And... So again, what, what is the system doing to try and match people um, with these sectors and, and really, you know, use this, use this COVID moment as a moment to really create opportunities for disabled people? A question from somebody listening in, which is how would you suggest an organisation promotes the fact that it has disabled members on staff in a respectful way? That's a good question, actually, because that's another part of this, right? You know, people are a bit, might be a bit anxious about how they talk about this even. Yeah, I mean, if, so first and foremost, you, you, you would always um, 
cheek with the individual that they were comfortable um, in you know, and, and however, you know, disability is is referenced and, you know, you'd give them the opportunity to, to tell that narrative. Um, I think you can be an organisation that talks generally about disability, you know, that, that you know, we support disabled people to work here. Um, you know, I think organisations can encourage staff to uh, come forward and, and talk about, you know, if they do have uh, an impairment and if people feel that they can't come forward to their organization then then that says something about the organization and so I think there's a bit of internal I'm not saying that about your organization I'm just meaning generally yeah. speaking um, so I think it is really important to encourage you know if, if just you know generally um, if you are you know if you identify as being disabled um, you know, we'd love to know because we want to make sure we're supporting you in the right way. Um, and also we want to promote um, inclusion in our workplace, et cetera. Uh, and then those who are comfortably sort of, you know, um, comfortably identify as disabled people, you know, having a conversation with them about what they're prepared to do and say and lead is important. It's, you know, there's that old saying, um, it's used mainly in relation to sort of gender balance or ethnic balance uh, in inclusion. Um, you know, you if you can see it, you can be it. That's part of the problem. Say with professional um, roles and, and firms such as, in, in professions such as the law, um, the reality is you can work a long time in the law and not work with a colleague who has a disability or who will talk about having a disability because as you said right at the outset some of these will be invisible but um so there isn't a real you know in professions like ours there isn't much visibility um and i'm sure that puts off potential recruits because you it's you've got to be pretty gutsy to be, want to be the first haven't you Absolutely. And, you know, I, that's precisely what I experienced sort of coming out of university. And I think I think that's why um, really um, regrettably I, I took that approach of sort of hiding disability because, you know, I just didn't see disabled people in, in positions. And so I think that creates, a, and, and it's, it's really tough because it creates a, a bit of a pressure and an onus on the disability community to be prepared to take on roles and be prepared to sort of, um, you know, step into leadership roles, um, stand for local council, stand for parliament. And, you know, um, one of the reasons that people will often, you know, feel they can't do that so easily is precisely because of the stigma that people face so it's a bit of a catch-22 we sort of we, we need that visibility of disabled leaders um, but we absolutely need to make sure that people are putting themselves forward into really safe environments. Interesting isn't it that um, you know in other um, organizations like the Institute for, of Directors for instance but other mm. but, there, but there's been other um, high profile business groups who've come behind campaigns to ensure that we have you know um, for instance, 25% of board members on listed companies would be female or that there would be a, a percentage or a ratio of, of Māori or Pacifica um, board members. We've never seen anything like that in respect of the disability community. Absolutely, and we should. And it's, and again, it comes back to the point we talked about a little earlier, it's it seems, I mean, that that sort of struggle for recognition really, it's this community is still some paces behind other communities. Yeah, and it's it's so fascinating because, you know, the the twenty four percent figure. Yeah, it's high. Uh, comes well, it's high, but but it's it's a twenty thirteen figure, right? Um, from the last disability survey, and that survey is being redone next year now. With our aging population, um, I, I have no doubt that figure will go up. Now, if you just take that figure and then you 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 say, well, every disabled person 
has at least one family member, then how the heck, this is not a majority issue for New Zealanders, mm. how it's difficult to get into you know, election debates. I mean, when you hear leaders debates or election debates, how often do you hear we're not doing enough for our disability community? Now that's, <laughs> there's something in there around the, the groundswell and advocacy, um, you know, collectively around disability issues because, you know, with, with a, every disabled person having a family member, more than half the country should be very, very focused on meeting the, the needs and aspirations of disabled people, yet somehow we're, we're not. And, and to be honest, it's, um, you know, there, there's some really interesting reading out there around how other, as you say, other population groups have uh, moved a bit faster than the disability community in terms of that, that sort of pride. And one of the reasons that you know, some of the, the research sort of points to that we haven't moved as fast is because we haven't done that own, our own community building from a pride perspective and that you need to have that pride as a community to sort of rally against the system and, 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 and sort of advocate for the system to do more. And so disability is one of those things that, you know, people can be in such different stages of their journey I think it's been hard to do that solid community building but it is being done now and it's being done now because we're really starting to see the emergence of young disabled people mm. claiming their place you know we have mm. I lead which is a network of young disabled people throughout the country who are you know that they're, they're, they're making noise and that's great mm. um, so more of that I think will will help well in fact that probably uh, I don't know whether you think this theory holds but I mean that probably is also a consequence of the switch away from institutional um, you know putting people with disabilities away from the rest of the community of uh, uh, one of the it will be a positive outcome of mainstreaming and the fact that this this generation and the one before it probably um, were more uh, we're presented with more opportunities, just broadly speaking. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, slowly disability is becoming something that, um, you know, it, it, is more, it is more visible. People are talking about it more. Uh, but we just, we just need more of that. We need more, you know, discussion about disability. We need you know, really need people to sh to shift that focus between thinking about disability as, as something that is because a person can't do something rather than actually the systems and structures and things we put in place as society that actually creates that, that disability. You know, the fact that a person, yeah. I mean, this is a very basic example, but the fact that a person, you know, one person in a chair can't get into a building and the other person who walks can. Um, that is not a reflection of the individual. That is a reflection of how we design buildings. <laughs> yeah, totally. But also I'm thinking that, you know, for people like you um, who are visible and, and um, you know, are there advocating, I mean, it must, there's a big burden on the very, there's a, there's a tiny number of you. There's a very small mm. number of you. I could probably name, you know, on one hand. Um, that's a big burden. So as a champion um, for the disabled community, you need more mm. peers, don't you? Because otherwise, you know, champions run out of steam. That's, we know that from other, you know, from history. Absolutely. And, and look, it is something that, you know, when, when you, you take on this sort of work, you, you do have to think about what, what other things in life sort of give you joy and um, uh, because when you when you have an impairment particularly if you're you know you're in pain um, which is you know um, you just are <laughs> often I mean I, I, I am I, it's just it's just a you know feature of living with impairment um, and 
so when you when you're working in it day in day out and you manage your own issues around your own impairment it can be hard to kind of get out of your head get out of your disability head it's just it's, it's all you're doing day in day out and so it is really important that the load is shared and it's really important that you can find those other things in your life you know family kids and hobbies sport and things that take you a bit out of it to to sort of bring back a, a some balance are you still cycling I absolutely am still cycling, just for fun. I'm, I'm, I possess no competitive talent anymore, but uh, I do do lots of mountain biking and lots of cycling for fun. It's my my very happy place. Fantastic. Hey, it's been a privilege to talk to you today and, um, and really interesting, and you've left us with a lot of things to think about, um, and I really appreciate it, and thank you very much. Nā mihi nui. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Linda. Bye, everyone. Bye, Kakite.